Welcome to the Live at Home series. We are your hosts, Rex. We're very excited to be joined today by one of my personal heroes. The late jazz critic Phil Elwood considered him one of the greatest saxophonists of his generation. And as the co-founder of Asian Improv Arts, he has proven to be one of the most influential artists, organizers, and educators to ever emerge from the Bay Area. Please give a warm welcome to the multi-talented Francis Wong. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. <laughs> hey. Hey. Yeah. We're rolling. Oh. Well, great to see you. How has 2023 been treating you so far? Pretty good. You know, it's, uh, well, we just passed the Lunar New Year, so, you know. Did you do anything to commemorate the occasion? Oh, you know, just make sure that, that the kids come home for dinner. <laughs> All right, so this interview is the first in a series commemorating our upcoming Bukas project premiering in May. This piece is intergenerational in nature, which is to say that it's all about applying the strategies of the past to the future. Apropos of that, I want to talk a bit about your past. We don't have to go back to, you know, kindergarten, but we'll get to music later. Okay. To begin, what were your first steps into activism that you can remember? My first major action was... Um when I was a senior in high school, right before, this was in 1975, actually in May of, six, of 75, which of course, if you look it up in history books, that's when Saigon fell. Yeah. And so, but it was also a period in which um, the public workers were starting to be able to go on strike. And, and so, um, the, 400 teachers in my school district went on strike and we had to decide as students whether to how to support them do we cross the picket line you know and I remember the, the first day of the strike my music teacher <laughs> was holding a sign and, and walking back and forth so he said so us music music guys we said oh well Mr. Heckman's on strike so we're on strike too. <laughs> so was there some sort of like structured element to your protest? Were you, did you form a marching band or did you? <laughs> well, it wasn't so much on that kind of creative side, but um, what, we, what we did was there was like a little team of us who uh, went around to this um, other schools to try to get students to boycott classes. As oh, wow, well. so was it like a district-wide yeah. sort of? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. what was the upshot of this action, do you remember? Well, you know, so first, so it was, I don't know, it was like a very close to the end of the semester, and so I was graduating, and actually I was a valedictorian, and so there was some... Well, worry about what I was going to say. And did, so, you, did you get to make the speech? Yeah, because it, they, they settled the strike you know, right. right before graduation. <laughs> the early 1980s were a really heady time for politics of color. We had Jesse Jackson's first presidential campaign, the racially motivated murder of Vincent Chin, the redress movement, etc. How did this time in history impact your personal approach to political engagement? Things uh, went into a whole different phase when Reagan was uh, elected the president. Was there an immediate response on the part of, you know, sort of leftist activists at that time? Oh, yeah, because um, John Jang and, and I, uh, we, like say, we organized a, a concert called um, Bob Reagan Out, All the Way Out. <laughs> Other friends of mine who were, you know, because I was um, trying to go to school at the time, they organize this um, Reagan Busters group. Yeah, this, so was, you, this was all kind of like Stanford kind yeah, of area? It's, yeah. yeah, at Stanford there yeah. was the Reagan. So, so just to clarify to the audience, you were you were a student at Stanford at the time? Yes. Well, this was happening, right? Yes, right. Yeah. Well, not exactly, but <laughs> <laughs> I would be known as an off-campus agitator. Off-campus agitator. Because I had flunked school t two times, so. Whoa. 
was it was it was it adjacent to your your sort of your political activity? Was there? Yeah, I just was too busy. You know, you to, had something to do. Yeah. So. so you know, would you say that this was kind of the beginnings of a career track for you, for kind of where you are now, kind of working in organizing and nonprofits and. Uh, yeah, for sure. Because yeah. it's. I think the first step was breaking out of the <coughs> model minority track. Sure. You know? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, so how would you summarize, I mean, for, for the non-initiated, how would you summarize the concept of the model minority in this context? So basically, they needed Asians to uh, represent a um, go with the, if you go with the program, there right. are rewards. And if you, and they uh, count, juxtapose that or counterpose that to uh, African American activism, right, and so there was a, a lot of pressure for Asians to uh, say, "Okay, we're not going to protest, we're not going to speak up, and we're going to work really hard and achieve the American dream." And so that we're evidence that that immigrants and people sure. of color could, you know, it's like part of pushing towards a post-racial <coughs> neoliberal. Future. Yeah, so would you say that your own activities around this 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 period in history was like was kind of like an act of rebellion against that? Was that was that foremost on your mind? Like I'm not really going to accord with these these norms that they want me to conform to. That was like yeah, yeah yeah. I mean it's just like my mom used to say you know like when she was young, growing up in this place of Mauritius, they tried to separate uh, the the uh, black Africans and the Chinese, hmm. and she was told not to uh, make friends with um, um, her uh, African uh, schoolmates. Wow! And then she said, "But I, I went ahead and made friends. So I wasn't. Curiosity. I wasn't going for it, you know." <laughs> Moving forward, um, you've noted that your saxophone kind of relates, um, in some sense, to the concept of self empowerment. So although live music is a performative art, in genres like jazz, there's an expectation that the performer kind of must reveal part of themselves mm. to the audience. So mm. when you play saxophone, what is your obligation to the prospect of self-expression? Well, it's everything. Hmm. I mean, it's... Uh, so the idea is that, um, that we should be uh, uh, true to ourself and... Right. And that's the that's what the the masters you know like whether it's you know Max Roach, um, Thelonious Monk, Dizzy Gillespie, they they're just saying that that's what we should do, not not copy what they're doing. It's interesting because I feel like the motivations, people's motivations when they get into this line of work, sometimes it's to kind of like evince mastery, mm -hmm. to kind of like showcase their skills that they've kind of mastered some kind of craft or some kind of art. But do you think that this kind of intersected? You know, vis-a-vis -vis what we were talking about just moments ago, do you think this intersected with your activist work? The idea that playing music could be a way to articulate your individuality, to kind of step outside of norms, was that part of the appeal to you? Well, yeah, because otherwise, you know, I, I may not have become become a musician if I didn't real uh, realize the idea that I could be my myself right. doing that. That's actually that's actually a really kind of interesting question. What was it about music as opposed to, say, you know, uh, the visual arts or poetry or filmmaking? What was it specifically about music that drew you in? Well, it's the sound and, yeah. you know, and the feeling in the room, hmm. you know. So it's just like, hey, you sit there at Keystone Corner and Max Roach is up there playing. and he's Keystone just, Corner, legendary <laughs> Bay Area jazz venue. You know, so, you know, it's like Max would get up there and he says, okay, I'm going to play this song, South Africa, God Damn, you know, which is yeah. kind of a, you know, because, you know, you heard of Nina Simone with the Mississippi God right. Damn. so it's kind of a... And so, you know, he'd just get up there and, you know, play this pretty moving, powerful, you know, music. And, uh, you know, that's who he is. That's who he was, that's who he is and at that moment. And so, um, as an Asian American coming into political consciousness of that time, we said, hey, that's, that's happening. And so, right. Uh, what do you think is your obligation to communicating with an audience? 
like when you're on stage, especially in kind of a, the line of work that we're in, where uh -huh. the music is kind of can be kind of incendiary or can be maybe even a little alienating to certain people. Like, what are we trying to get across to the audience? Well, I don't know whether it's exactly like this one-to-one -one communication. It's mm -hmm. more of like we're in the room together and this is who I am and actually being vulnerable to um, what everybody's going to see, to actually show yourself. Yeah. Because I, I think that uh, there's a there's a danger when you use this idea of communication is that to is that what we call mediate you're mediating yourself right and so we have a responsibility particularly in this art form to actually um, break through that mediation you know so that we are who we are the storied Asian improv arts was founded in 1987. And if I have my timeline correct, it began as a record label and later became a nonprofit. That's right. So for all the new listeners, can you explain Asian Improv Arts' mission statement? Like what is the kind of end goal of the organization? Well, our original mission <clears throat> was to produce and um, document and um, promote the works that uh, advance the experiences of Asians in the United States you know and of course that those experiences are with other Asians but it could be with everyone else in the society and that's why I fit well with um, you know our background in in jazz you know right in terms of you know building uh, a uh, contributing and being you know invited to you know be part of the lineage uh, we have since um, uh, changed our mission because what we've been able to accomplish in the last 35 years is, is this idea of a network and a milieu of artists who are self-empowered and self-producing. Right. So, I mean, even though you've kind of been at the core of it, you and other individuals like John Jang have been at the core of this organization, how much of it do you think is... Um, predicated on the notion of coalition building, of kind of building relationships. Well, absolutely. <coughs> I mean, it's you know because in in some ways the inspiration goes back to the third world strikes and the idea of the third world liberation front. Can you talk a bit about that? Kind of explain what that was. So back in '68, um, there was a, a strike at San Francisco State. Um, for ethnic studies, for equity, and um, so it was start, uh, led by the BS Black Student Union, but ultimately uh, there was a whole range of, of, of um, political movements that joined together with the BSU um, that coalesced around the Third World Liberation Front. and. The strike went on for months and months and months, and mm -hmm. it's still the longest student strike in American history. The very beginning of, like, say, my consciousness right. is, was really about the Third World Liberation Front. This is actually kind of leading to the next question. We talk a bit in our work about the importance kind of, of mutual aid and solidarity across cultures. You've had storied collaborations with the likes of Joseph Jarman, Bobby Bradford, and William Roper, Max Roach. What do you think is the importance of Black Asian alliances in our own work? Well, it's a necessity. It's a historical imperative, you know, because um, we have to understand that we live in a racialized society. Sure. Yeah. And sometimes people confuse an ethnicity with race. Different. Different constructs yeah different different constructs because race is really then um it created a racial hierarchy in this country right yeah you know and the rule is white supremacy so if we're ever going to get rid of white supremacy it's going to take you know a coalition of those who suffer right under white 
supremacy. Right. Well, kind of moving into performance practice, so this is kind of like an adjacent consideration. This idea, whether it's coded in any sort of cultural markers, what is the role of ritual in your music? Well, I don't know. I'm pretty influenced by what Anthony Braxton said in, um, is it the Graham Lock? Graham Lock, Forces in Motion? Yeah. Forces in Motion, Where yeah. he talked about composition as encoding or performance as encoding. Hmm. So if you look at performance as encoding, and and then of course there's actually on the cultural studies side, you know, there's this guy Stuart Hall, I don't know if you know. Yeah, him, for sure. Who talks yeah. about e encoding and decoding. Hmm. And so if you look at performance as encoding histories, encoding values, right. encoding aspirations then you know um, then you you need ritual to do that as um, I think Threadgill I saw that this interview Henry Threadgill the great Henry Threadgill he said yeah. something about how music rises from the so your social reality and so the idea right. is if your social reality is um, multiple and intersectional then there's codes that uh, come through in your expression. I saw this kind of interesting. I mean, when I when I went to Europe with um, um, Al Alan Silva's celestial communication, celestial communication <laughs> orchestra, the great Alan Silva, yes, yeah, bass player. And, yeah. and I remember we were in Italy. Uh, no, we were in Poschiavo, and he goes, Francis, you're Chinese. That's interesting. <laughs> he was just talking about, you know, when he was kind of growing up, uh, I guess it was on the Lower East Side, so it was yeah, like yeah, neighbors yeah. adjacent to Chinatown. Yeah. And then just like to think that at one time, that at one po at some point in the future, folks in Chinatown or come from that experience would be playing creative music. Right. Absolutely. You know, so that's yeah. what I'm saying. It's just like getting the codes. Yeah. Because right, right, right. in a lot of ways, what we were, what we've been able to um, hear and experience is code. So this is still going on. Yes, you're the co-host. What have you been doing for the past fifteen minutes? Oh, diaper change, milk, play with toys. So. Shifting gears again, I'm familiar as a fan with his work, but I don't know him. Can you tell us a little bit about the late Glenn Horiuchi? A crazy guy. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, of course, he, 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 um, his musical legacy is many um, albums, many ensembles, important collaborations like with uh, Joseph Jarman, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, um, and uh, Madara Leo Smith, and uh, William Roper, and and like Glenn. There's a lot of things that went into being Glenn. One, you know, of course, part of it is like he, his folks went to concentration camps in World War Two, right? You know, and then um, Glenn, like me, was a political activist, and uh, he was a, played a major role in mobilizing communities around redress and reparations yeah yeah, yeah. you know but also so redress and reparations for those who aren't familiar directly addressing like japanese internment in world that's war right, II. That's yeah right. he was actually I th i'm i don't know if you got this from glenn but i've actually noticed or or if it was something that you figured out at the same time but if you're familiar with the notation of cecil taylor i feel like it's one of the few instances of someone successfully applying that kind of concept, like kind of the unit structure concept, mm -hmm. to like making music that didn't necessarily sound like that. That was kind of original. And, right. And, yeah. So it became, it's more about methodology. Western thought is based on this idea of, uh, I think they call it instrumentalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, like the, it's like a machine. Right. And so, right. Gonna, so you. This is you already them. much deeper than these normally do. Wait, the guy was a real deep dive. So, I think the whole idea is that these tools of expression are 
it, if you don't know the tools, yeah. you can't express yourself. Of course, of course. You which know? is not to say that you you shouldn't learn your chord changes, you shouldn't learn the fundamentals of harmony. All of this is important. But the idea that that is sort of like the end of like music making, I feel like is like a kind of a Western concept. Right, because a lot of it is like. Uh, 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 it's definitely not linear. Right. And it's definitely, um, what do you call it? Well, it's definitely multidimensional. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So learning your chord changes allows you to do certain things and make certain, to certain tool to grasp what some of these guys are, uh, have done, you know. Because a, a lot of it, is a lot of it in the West is we're just trying to figure out what somebody else did. Right. So we can reverse engineer it. Well, that's my editorial part. <laughs> you know? It's well, like some can you, of these can you, composers, you know, going this is a, This is a great story, by the way. And Francis, you've told this to me so many times. But I feel like it's instructive. Um, something I've, I've been told, and I feel like this is not necessarily apocrypha, um, this idea that when people were originally codifying the sort of advanced harmony that was used in bebop, they weren't using the standard chord notation that we use now. They weren't like saying um, D7, sharp nine, you know, like they, they weren't necessarily writing it that way. That's kind of a name that we've given a sound. Yeah. So it's this other thing, like you were playing with Max Roach and you were gonna play Billy's Bounce. Do you, do you remember the anecdote I'm talking about? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, so, what was the, so what was the story there? Well, I think the the way I understand it is that there weren't names for tunes. Right, right, right. Yeah, that was given well because they had to publish. They had to publish. You need this. You need to put it on a record yeah, so somebody yeah, needs yeah. to call it something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what what happened in that performance? Well, so okay, so at that time in his career, this is in year I think two thousand. Again, this is Max Roach. Max is. You know, we, you know, because he always was didn't want to play the old tunes. Right. They always wanted him to play the old tunes. Right. And he didn't want to do that, so of he course. wanted to keep on moving. Of forward. course. And if and he yeah. made these really important records with Anthony Braxton and Cecil Taylor. Yeah. So I thought we were just going to play free. Right. You know, because that's you know, because what well, well, what happened is that he comes on stage, and you know, and 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 John asks him, "What do you want to do?" And he says, "I want to play duets." And then he says, well, who do you want to play with first? And then he points at me. Saxophone player. <laughs> you <Yeah>. know? <laughs> so, and so then I said, okay, so what are we going to do? Um, you know, this is like 800 people in the audience, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And then he just hums. Ba -da -ba -da -ba this is on stage? Yeah. <laughs> he just kind of hums, right? Yeah. And then, I don't think you can hum that much of it because of the copyright. Like the yeah. first bar or something like yeah. that so uh that's what coding means because right because if if i didn't know the code like i didn't know that tune then Thank you. 
Welcome back to the Live at Home series. We're here with the great Francis Wong. Before we wrap things up, do you have any upcoming events or projects that you'd like to talk about? Since we're on the internet, I will be playing at the World Stage. In Los Angeles? Yeah. Yes. So, Fantastic. World Stage. I love that place. Um, who are, who, um, who are you going to It's going to be Purple Gums. Purple Gums. So that's um, Francis's group with the great Bobby Bradford and William Roper. When's that going to be? April 7th. Is that live streamed? Or... I don't know what they do. If you live in Los Angeles, just go to it. Carl Evangelista's Bucas, featuring the great Francis Wong, premieres May 27 and 28. Next month, we'll be welcoming our very own Race Gampavia, who will be offering her insights on her participation in the project. Sundays, don't confess indoors, but boy, I hate Mondays. Okay, Garfield, spin your hot wheels. Boy, ain't got hot meals, but father, there's the real deal. And all the dread I don't conceal. Man, it helps some people, but give me something I can feel in the torture of my blood. And everyone's looking for something they can feel in the suffering of their blood. So how can there be overlords when everything is God? So how...